suppose I should leave this here, <laughs> this thing. Um, you know, I always think of Psalms 51 when we sing that song, where David says, the offering of God is a broken and a contrite heart, and a broken and contrite heart he will not despise. You know, most of the time we operate in our own strength, in our own, you know, what we consider our area of expertise, and God just wants us to operate in His. And with that in mind, I want you to turn this morning, this Father's Day, to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. We've already read it, but I want to read it again as we begin this series of messages. He says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Amazing verses. Uh, They're only rivaled by, I think, uh, some passages in Colossians or some passages in 2 Peter uh, about the amazing incredible impact of the Word of God on people's lives. Now, as has become our tradition on Father's Day, uh, I've asked six different men, myself included, to uh, expound on these two verses so that all our men and all of us might gain a clearer understanding of the place the Word of God has in our lives because it is the very foundation of every Christian's life. Try to bypass the Word of God, and you will become this emotional-driven, basically fruitless, not-growing Christian. The Word of God is where it's at uh, in the vernacular. We here at OEFC take these verses very seriously. Our goal as a church is to glorify God by knowing God and serving God and serving others, and sharing the gospel with the unsaved. And we do that by believing and living out in our daily lives the inspired, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. It's our manual. It's our compass. It guides us through life. And I'm talking about it in neuter terms, but really we encounter the living Word through the written Word, don't we? He is the one who really guides us by the power of His Holy Spirit because the Word of God is the foundation of everything in the Christian's life. It's the source of saving truth. We read that earlier where Grandmother Lois and Mother Eunice brought the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament at this point, to bear on Timothy's life, and Timothy became a believer. He was saved. He came into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul came into his life, discipled him, and he became the uh, the godly man that he would become later on in life. But the Word of God was the very foundation, and it started in his home. In fact, Jesus said in John 5, 24, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and has passed from judgment and death to life. Psalms 19, 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect restoring or converting the soul. Amazing statement. The Word of God in its totality transforms and shapes and molds and saves and sanctifies the true believer's life. It's indispensable in the life of a believer. If you really want to grow, if you really want to be used of God, if you really want to be fruitful, as we're going to see, the Word of God is the key that opens the door to all of that. As one writer said, the the truth of the Word, when mixed with faith in Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, leads to spiritual life. And it might add to life eternal because it's the Word of God that introduces us to the one who is eternal life, Jesus Christ. That's the beauty of the Word. It's not just a history book, although it has plenty of history. It's not just a spiritual how-to book or how to improve your life book, although it has a lot of that too. But what it does, it introduces you to the one who is life itself. Incredible, incredible book. Again, Jesus said in, in John chapter 5, verse 39, he was talking to the Pharisees who looked at it like I just described it. 
They looked at it as history. They looked at it as, as something uh, that other than it was, he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. They had the right idea. A little bit. Then he went on to say, it is, you, it is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life. Then later on he would tell his disciples that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. The exclusivity of Christ. Because as the old rabbi turned Christian theologian Charles Feinberg, who was the president of Talbot when I went there, he once said, I find Jesus Christ on every page of Scripture. I love that. Why? Because he had a mindset where he was looking for Christ. He was looking for typology. He was looking for references to the coming Messiah. And then as he read the New Testament, he had the life of the Messiah, the, the doctrine concerning the Messiah. He saw Jesus Christ everywhere because Christ is everything. But the Pharisees missed the point, didn't they? But we haven't, have we? We know what Feinberg said is true. We haven't missed the point. And that's our goal, isn't it? To get the point. You know, as Paul said in Philippians 3.10, he says, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, to be conformed to his death. And how is that made possible? Well, through believing and living out the revealed word of God. Simple as that. You know, we kind of, probably all of us have at least 10 Bibles in our home. Uh, but the point is, read it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny, I like to exercise, and I've picked up exercise machines down through the years and put them into my gym, and I actually use them. Because the people I got them from didn't. They, they bought the thing, and then all of a sudden it, they realized that they actually had to put forth some effort to use the thing. And then that became too much work, and so I got it cheap. <laughs> but, you know, we can, we can look at our Bibles the same way, huh? You know, we've got ten of them, but which one do we read, and how often do we read it? We should read it every day, every night before we go to bed. When we get up the first thing in the morning, you know, while you're, instead of reading the Fresno liberal B, read, read the, uh, the inspired, authoritative, inerrant word of God. You know, so Paul says all scripture, both the Old and New Testament, and the, well, the accumulating, at this point, the accumulating writings of the New Testament are inspired by God, literally breathed out by God or simply God breathed. You might say, Scripture is from the mind and mouth of God, and in it he reveals himself and his truth to us. Second Peter, he says in chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, he tells us, Scripture was never made by an act of the human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And, and I might add, as he used their mind and character and heart to express his words. That's divine inspiration. In that regard, the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, contain at least 680 claims to divine inspiration. The historical books, 418. The poetic books, 195. The, the prophetic books, 1,307. And the New Testament contains at least 300 direct quotations and at least 1,000 in, indirect references to the Old Testament as God's word and revelation. It's amazing. In all, there are over 4,000 claims in the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, that this is God's inspired, God-breathed word. And then Paul adds, and profitable for teaching. You know, truth is never out of season, is it? told Timothy, he says, preach it in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And we'll talk about that when the other guys come up. But 
The Greek word for profitable, ophelimos, means beneficial, productive, sufficient. And I said, as I said, I'm going to let the next five guys tell you how the Word of God is profitable, beneficial, productive, and sufficient in our lives as we go about teaching one another and teaching and leading our families as both fathers and mothers and kids. You can let the Word of Christ, as Colossians 3.16 says, dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. And the, the word admonishment means to counsel with the, the idea of correcting a behavior and bringing to bear the right behavior. So, I'm going to ask Brother Dave Colaccio to come up and tell us how the Word of God is profitable for reproof. Before I get started, uh, there's a Toyota Terso gray color outside. It has its lights on. So if someone has that car, they need to go out and check their lights. <clears throat> All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. This morning I am going to uh, talk about the second thing after teaching, and that's reproof. Now, reproof is a harsh word, and because it's so, such a harsh word, Pastor Bob has given me 30 minutes to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it literally means to rebuke, to rebuke false teaching, uh, to rebuke error, and to rebuke sin. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So we have the word... Uh, this is, that just goes deeply into our bodies, not only our bodies, but our souls, as it was just, as I just read. So reproof is to comfort someone, or excuse me, reproof is to confront someone with a view towards convicting them of misbehavior, not to tear someone down, but to restore them. So we have to remember reproof, as Bob said, is profitable for us. And it's, a, and it's a view towards convicting someone of their sin to have them come back into the fold. Uh, God's word is powerful. It builds us up. It gives us joy, peace, love, and hope. That is why we confront our brothers and sisters, to bring them back into the fold. Jesus tells us the parable of the lost sheep and how important it is to find that sheep. That is a picture of reproof. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.20, those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. Wow, that's scary. So reproof is done so others see it. Not many of us want that to happen. <laughs> so let me interject here the first part of that verse. Those who continue in sin. And who are they? They're the lost sheep. Okay? Church discipline in Scripture makes it clear that two or three are to go to that person about their sin. Then, if any continue, continue in it, they are brought before the congregation. So reproof is not exposing everyone's dirty laundry. That is not at all what God's Word tells us to do. We are to reproof in love. We are to... Uh, re we are to reproof, to bring our brother, our sister back into a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Many people believe falsely that, that it is the work of the pastors or elders. Not so. It is the work of all believers. All of us need to shine our light in the darkness. So the word builds, uh, builds a foundation of truth, but... That also is accompanied by work of conviction. 
By confronting our brother or sister, we are trying to turn them from their error of their sin to save their soul. And we do that in a loving way. Therefore, the word is not just a builder. It is something that rips and tears and sheds what deserves to be torn, which is false doctrine and sin. It's like a doctor with a scalpel cutting out cancerous tumors. That's exactly what reproof is. It's getting inside of us, inside our hearts, inside our minds, and wants to cut out that sin that was in our lives. As we listen to the Word of God, as we read the Word of God, as we study deeply the things of God, it begins to cut away the sins in our life. Therefore, the first rebuking words, or excuse me, re- rebuking work of the Word then is, is towards the sin in the life of a believer. It's in our lives. God works in our lives because we claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> the Bible not only teaches the truth of God, but it also teaches the truth about ourselves and gives many warnings and rebukes about our conduct. Um, it's easy for me and for others to look out there and say, wow, what a sinner that guy is. Whoa, what a sinner that lady is. But first, we need to get the log out of our eye before we talk about someone else's sin. So remember that also. The Bible is a very honest book, and it never whitewashes any of God's servants who appear in its pages. I'm talking about Abraham, Moses, King David, and that's just to name a few. Their faults and and failings are all clearly set forth so that we may learn from them. As for ourselves, when we read the Bible, we are to take the blinders off and see ourselves as we really are in the sight of God. And that can be a painful experience. We constantly fall into sin and give way to temptation. And when we come to the Word of God, it rebukes us. We may succeed in keeping our conscience quiet for a time as long as we keep clear of the Bible. My challenge to us this morning is let's read the Bible. You probably say, Dave, I read the Bible. Oh, let's be honest. Do you read it every day? And if you do, I say, praise the Lord. But what I'm really saying is let's get serious with God. There will be verses and passages that make us feel extremely uncomfortable. And I say, hallelujah. Why do I say such a word? Because that bring, that, they bring us to us that we have grieved the Holy Spirit. So by getting into the Word, the Word shows you your sin, and you're grieved. If you have the Holy Spirit in it, you're going to be grieved, and you're going to want to confess that sin. You're going to, want to get right with God again. And until we take the reproof to heart, repentance and confession, we will never know inner peace or make further progress in our walk with the Lord. Let me close with this scripture. It's from 1 Timothy 4.8. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, which is all powerful and full of truth. Lord, godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take out of it either. Lord, help us to fight the good fight of faith and keep our minds on you. May we learn from your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Don? I'm here. Good morning. I think I drew the short straw on correction, but I'm okay with that, um, for those of you that know me. Uh, And so to define correction, sometimes we need to go look at the definition, see what it says about that. So with regards to correction, um, it says uh, the act of offering an improvement to replace a mistake or setting something right. Makes sense. Uh, a quantity that is added or subtracted in order to increase the accuracy 
possibly even of a, like a scientific measure of some sort, a correction, a fudge factor. Um, how about a rebuke for making a mistake? Or a drop in the stock market activity or stock prices following a period of increases? Uh, a lot of us are not wanting that right now. Um, with, the, with the market doing what the market's doing right now, and then discipline the act of punishing or correction, a treatment of a specific defect. Uh, Matthew Henry, I think, um, as we look at and we've studied the scriptures and we've seen 1 Timothy and we see 2 Timothy, I like what Matthew Henry says about 2 Timothy. He says, where Timothy now is not really certain when he wrote the second book of uh, 2 Timothy, but he says, Matthew Henry says, the scope of this epistle somewhat differs from that of the former, not so much relating to his office of an evangelist, but more to his personal conduct and behavior, which is really what we're talking about this morning, right? We're talking about conduct. We're talking about behavior in, in these two, these short verses that we're talking about. Lots of scriptures to go over with regards to correction, right? Some of them come to our mind right away. A couple of them um, was uh, Proverbs 12.1. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid tough word, right? I mean, if you go and look at the Hebrew for the word stupid, you know what it says? Stupid. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Proverbs 15.32, he who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. That kind of encapsulates it in many ways as we think about what correction does, okay? So when I think about correction and, we th and we're looking at the scripture and we're seeing what the scripture does in our lives as far as correction, oftentimes we as human beings deal with correction on a horizontal level with each other. So we have this vertical correction that comes through the Word of God, and we're going to talk about that, and we're going to overlay that with a what, lot of what is said this morning. But then there's also this horizontal correction thing that we talk about. Dave touched on that, and the other guys will also touch on that. So when I think about that, I also think, you know, what is the intent? What's the intent? When somebody comes to you to correct you, what is, the, what is the intent? You oftentimes feel that. You know if the intent's good or bad, right? So for those of us who know God and seek him, we know that his pleasures for our good and not for our hurt, right? We see the scriptures, and we know that his intent is for our good. For those of us who know mankind and seek him, know that his pleasure is not always for our good, and yes, sometimes is out to hurt us. Hmm. So when we think about correction, when we think about intent of the people that are possibly coming to us, because we can read the Word of God and we can see where it instructs us and it teaches us, and yes, it does correct us. But we also need to look at it when we're dealing with each other on an individual basis, what does that correction look like? I did a talk one time on uh, when it's wrong to be right, you know, anybody kind of understand what that's all about, right? So God's intent is always good. Man's intent can be good or bad. And when I think about that, I think of, obviously, the wrestling with the flesh and the spirit. We do that on a daily basis, right? Like PB has said in the past, when you become a Christian, all you've done is increase your options by one. Now you get to wake up tomorrow morning and say, am I going to live for God or am I going to live for me? Am I going to live in the spirit, or am I going to walk in the flesh? Kind of simple. I'm a binary guy. I'm a programmer. Life is easy that way. So when you have two choices, you get to make the choice. What is the choice you're going to make? How are you going to live? Are you going to live for yourself, or are you going to live for others, right? So when I think of Romans 8, I'll just read this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the Spirit in life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in, in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's the choice again, right? For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Good intent from man, oftentimes as believers, is Holy Spirit driven. Bad intent is fleshly driven. 
Keep in mind, the scripture is designed for the man and the woman of God. I was in Nepal in 2007 visiting a friend who started a ministry there. And I remember walking, and Prajwal wanted me to, we were walking from village to village in, in the outskirts of Nepal. And he had me walking with these two former Hindu priests. And he says, Don, ask, ask the guy about his, his, his uh, walk with God. And so we were talking and everything. He says, I remember when I was given the Bible the first time. He said, I read the Bible in 30 days. This is the Hindu priest talking to me through a translation. And I thought, wow, and Prajwal smiling the whole time. He says, now ask him what he learned. I said, what did you learn? He says, absolutely nothing. He wasn't a believer. He had no, the, his eyes weren't revealed to the scriptures. And he unpacked this through this walk from village to village, speaking for an hour and talking about his life and how he got converted by the scriptures and, and, and came coming to the full knowledge of Jesus Christ. Pretty amazing to have read the scriptures for, to read the entire Bible in 30 days and to know absolutely nothing about it. So the word is our daily mail. It's your daily mail if you're a believer. Now, I'll ask you one thing, and this, you, you guys, it's just a rhetorical question is, when you read the word, does it mean anything to you? Because if it doesn't mean anything to you, it might not be your mail. Hmm. If we look to the word of God and follow its instructions, we shall be made men and women of God. I have a friend who on a daily basis, and PB has already mentioned this, uh, does not read man's word until he first reads God's word. A tall order with all of us who have devices in our hands that give us incredible access to vast amounts of data. This device can be used for good or for bad, right? We know that. I read once more from Hebrews, I'm going to read from Hebrews 12, 11, because we need to hear this loud and clear. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And all God's people said, happy Father's Day. I'm reminded on Father's Day, looking back across my own life, thinking about my dad, and there's some highlights. I remember when I was about seven, it was about 40 years ago, but I still remember this. I was playing soccer. I wasn't even that good. But as I would run along, if I ever looked to the sideline where my dad was, he was running along with me on the sideline, no matter where I went on the field. And his favorite thing to say was, kick the tar out of it. <laughs> He'd be yelling that, kick the tar out of it. <laughs> but I still remember it. I still, I still see him doing that. If you fast forward a little bit on into high school, I remember playing football. And my dad was in the Army. He got up at, oh, dark 30 and didn't come home till late at night. And he only had a little break for lunch. But in the summer, we'd have football practice during the day, and I remember many times during practice looking over, and my dad would be there on his lunch break watching me practice. Yeah. Those things impact a young man. That has an impact. I remember as an adult, my dad sitting there, we we're just watching TV, hanging out in the living room. This is only a few years ago. But as an adult, if you're an adult, you realize, I'm sure, that sometimes life is tough. Sometimes you don't feel all that great about where things are heading or how you're doing. But my dad, we're just sitting there doing a commercial, and he looked over at me and goes, son? Yeah? If he calls you son, you listen. I just want you to know I'm really proud of the man you are. Dads can have an impact. And let me, let me rephrase that. Dads will have an impact. Fathers will have an impact. What kind of impact is the only question. That's it. You will have an impact if you are a father. You need to pay attention. My section this morning 
says, training in righteousness. All scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. The totality of scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. There is not one part of scripture that could be described as not profitable for training in righteousness. So what does this mean, this training in righteousness? What does it mean? The Greek word translated training is pahadia. So that answers your question, right? <laughs> it actually means something. Pahadia is a Greek word. It means tutorage, that is, education or training. By implication, disciplinary correction or chastening, chastisement, instruction, nurture. All of these meanings are encompassed in the word pahadia. Scripture is our tutor, it is our educator, it is our disciplinarian, it is our coach, it is our trainer. It is all of these things, or at least it could be, and it should be. Now wait just a second. The verse says all Scripture is profitable, not all Scripture could be or should be. Now if you thought that when I said those words, you would be correct. All scripture is profitable for training. Not it could be profitable, not it should be profitable. It is profitable. It is. So why did I say it could be or it should be? You know, God is sovereign. That means he is in control. God is in supreme control of his creation right down to the very smallest details. That is what Jesus was expressing in Matthew 10, 29, when he said, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. It's also what Paul meant in Colossians 1, 15 and 16, when he said, he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Incidentally, in Colossians, Paul is not only expressing the absolute sovereignty of God, but also expressing very clearly, I might add, that Jesus is the very same thing. He has that very same authority and thus is himself the God of heaven. So I ask again, if God is so much in control, and we see that he is in scripture, then why Am I saying that it could be or that it should be profitable? Well, God is sovereign and there is no debate about it. God's ultimate control is taught throughout Scripture, and yet we cannot discount our participation, our involvement in his working out his perfect will in our lives. There is, in fact, a little bit of a paradox in this statement, for all scripture is profitable in training and for righteousness. And that's a fact. I mean, that is true. And yet built into that very statement is the idea that it is not for everyone, or at least its effectiveness as far as training goes, do not, does not produce in everyone the same good results. Not everyone cares for the scripture, Right? I mean, there are those people who actually despise it and mock it. And for them, it certainly loses its effectiveness in its training for righteousness, doesn't it? At the same time, I can look at my little life and tell you that there are times in my life when Scripture doesn't train me as well as it could. I have to admit that even now, as the Scripture trains me, I bet it could still train me better. So God is sovereign, and he is working his sovereign will out in my life, and he is using his scripture to do it, and yet I still have a part to play. If I only read the scripture sometimes, it will have less ability to shape me or to tutor me or to train me than if I read it and study it and meditate on it and memorize it constantly. 
You see, my participation counts. Your participation counts. Scripture, all of Scripture, sitting on a shelf contained within a closed Bible will not train me or you or anyone. Dads, we're called to be leaders. Husbands, we're called to be leaders. What does that mean? What does it mean to lead in a godly way? Well, let me tell you, it doesn't mean that you pick where you go out to eat. That's not leading. That's not what it means. Leading is by both example and by word. Example being you pick up the word of God and your family knows you do. You read what it says. Your family knows you do. And you follow what it says in your life and your family knows you do. That is the kind of leadership that is necessary. That is the most important kind of leadership a father or a husband can bring to any family, any home. How does the Bible train us in righteousness? How does it do it? Well, the great truths of Scripture have to get in us first. And then we must apply them to our lives in faith that God is true and will produce through this activity, this training in righteousness. The righteousness that is spoken of is that of Christ-likeness or Christ-like character. All scripture is profitable for training us to be like Christ. You want to be a good dad? You want to be a good father? You want to be a good husband? Be like Christ would be in that position. How do you do that? Through the scripture and applying it to your life. This is what is meant in Romans when it says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. What will transform us at that level? Only God can do such a thing. And he has chosen to do it through his spirit working through his word. But we must remember God generally does not work outside of us, but he works through our effort. You can actually participate in God's working in your life through your dedication and the constant study of his word. So, Dad, what are you waiting for? All scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. So let's do something about that. as I'll get out. Oh, man, I'm glad God is patient, merciful, kind, <laughs> loving, understanding, <laughs> because we're just a bunch of humans that come short. And uh, my, uh, what I was asked to share, uh, first of all, it's an honor and a privilege. Thank you, Pastor Bob, for allowing me to share with you guys. Um, this is the first time I come before you in front here, and it's a big responsibility. Uh, it's a privilege. And uh, I'm very nervous. Okay, that's the truth. And I have brothers here that, have, that know the word way more than I do, but I'll give it my best shot. So my uh, word is uh, adequate. The word adequate. The opposite of adequate is inadequate. So I look... <laughs> right? <laughs> um... Maybe I missed my calling. I shouldn't have been a plumber. I should be a stand in front of people and make them laugh, right? <laughs> it just comes natural. It's not my goal, Lord. I don't want them to laugh, please. 
uh, adequate in the Oxford Dictionary. I, had to, I looked it up, so I had to put down my plumbing tools and say, okay, I got to take this serious because I want to be adequate. I want to be an adequate man of God, just like I want to be an adequate plumber. Uh, when we're in the military, and uh, Mike Rollinson knows this, you have to have adequate training, the adequate equipment to, get, to carry out the mission. And as fathers, we need to be, uh, we need to have that, um, we need to be adequate to train our children, to bring them up, to be the father that we need to be according to the word of God. So I looked it up, and adequate uh, means satisfactory, acceptable in quality or quantity, and inadequate, and this really stood out, lacking the quality or quantity required, insufficient for a purpose, and it, there is a synonym here, it's, or it, it, uh, it reads, unable to deal with a situation or with life. Inadequate man, sad and solitary. Sol solitary. Inadequate to the task. So my question to us is, are we that adequate fa father? Okay, are we uh, bringing up our children children and training them. Forgive me, I'm very nervous. Pray for me as I speak, please. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so in order to be adequate, we must study God's word. We must look at it and study and put his word in our hearts so that through this we can train our children and we can uh, not be ashamed when God examines our life. So if God were to examine my life and my heart now, are we going to be ashamed? Okay. Um, so this is good for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete glasses on. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. 2 Timothy 2.24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. R.C. Sproul, I looked this up, he had a quote, and he said, Here then is the real problem of our negligence. We fail in our duty to study God's word, not so much because it is difficult to understand, not so much because it is dull and boring, but because it is work. Our problem is not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. Our problem is that we are lazy. And I must confess that that is, I, I've, I'm guilty of that. I've been guilty of that. I believe that I could have been a much more adequate father when my children were younger and I look back now wishing that what I know now I could have known then or that I would have been more uh, prepared because I was either distracted by the world, doing my job, being uh, and not picking up God's word and studying it so that I could be prepared to be the father that I needed to be. So now that I'm older and my girls are all grown, I still strive to be that father, because you're a father till to the very end, right? We're not fathers just when the kids are little. I have, we have grown daughters that go from 26 to 39 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. <laughs> I, I mean it. If anybody wants to talk after the service and ask Pastor Bob questions about any mistake or any foolish thing I said, I'll be there. You can correct me, reproof me, <laughs> exhort me, admonish me. I'm open. I'm, I'm just, 
I just love you guys. I love God with all my heart. But I have to confess, uh, we get lazy. And a lot of times when we're lazy, we don't read the Bible every day. So if we don't read his word, not like a novel or not like a, just a book. Oh, I did my reading today. Yep, I'm telling all my friends. Yep, I read the word today. But are we studying it? Are we putting it in our heart? Are we applying this so that we may be adequate? And the word, and I even looked this up. This is pretty cool because I'm a plumber. I'm a simple mountain guy that books are a new thing to me, you know? <laughs> Reading. <laughs> I can't. You're going to have to uh, correct me later. <laughs> uh, it, the root word is ikano. So that explains it all right there. It's Greek because <laughs> the New Testament was written in Greek. Greek and it means uh, reaching the place of sufficiency. Making someone qualified, competent, right? To make sufficient, to render fit, to equip one with adequate power to perform the duties of one. So that's, that's my challenge to us as fathers, as parents, as men of God. Um, are we adequate? Are we studying the word? Are we encouraging one another to study the word? Are we exhorting one another, encouraging one another so that we could be, today is Father's Day, so uh, this is geared to us fathers, to be adequate fathers, to step aside and get out of our work mentality and, you know, and to read the word every day and to apply it, whether you have little children, you have grandkids, or you have grown children. Because I've seen that with my older daughters, they have different challenges now. They have their own families. They have their own lives. They have, they have their children. And as a, grand, as a father and a grandfather, I want to be adequate so that I can encourage them, so that they can. Um, and this encouragement and this bringing, it's, it, it's with the idea of, of to maintain us in right standing with God. I don't want to encourage or correct just to get my point across it's so that we can be constantly in right, right standing with Christ. That's the whole purpose, right? Because God is constantly sanctifying us every day if we allow him. If we allow him because we have to surrender every day to him. We can go astray daily, all the time if we want. Not lose our salvation, but we can go astray with our thoughts, our attitudes. We can become lazy, lethargic, and that's going to affect how we um, live our lives are we, are we that living testimony to our own children? You know, do they see this guy that just goes to church, but at home it's a whole different person, it's a whole different life, then you come to church and you've got your Sunday best and you're talking Christianese. Are you that same person? Christianese? Is that it? Yeah. I don't like that. I like to just be me in Christ, within his boundaries. Uh, the bottom line is, do we love God with all our heart? And so that's going to propel us to be that adequate father. So I think I've talked enough. That's it. Yeah, that's it. It's actually not me. Does anyone know where Dave Mulkey is? Dave Mulkey. Oh, there he is. Good morning. Well, uh, John 3.16, was that it? No, 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 it's just, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, that's right, yes. Yeah, well, 
Good morning. Uh, equipped for every good work. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I need to. I need to equip myself. Oh wow. Uh, I like being equipped. I like being equipped and, and ready to go for the day. And um, wow, if you're going to be equipped for good works, you have to be prepared for life, right? Right? Yeah, all right, all right, all right. You guys are like, I'm not listening to some guy with a shower cap on. That's why I took it off. <laughs> all right. And all right. Thanks, Seneca. Uh, all right. So when I think of being equipped for good works, I think that I need, as most men need, equipment. All right? I need equipment. I'm not going to go build a house without a hammer and nails. I can stand there in front of the lumber all day long, and I couldn't do much with it. I might go to cook dinner. I couldn't do much with the food on that stove until I had a pot or a pan or fuel to light the fire. So we are to be equipped for every good work. Although, uh, yeah, and we have a uh, Good equipment here. Uh, you have to keep your tools in order. You need to uh, keep your wrenches and uh, uh, your, your other tools going in the right direction. Although, uh, we're equipped for good works, right? And so when you learn to use your tools properly, you can do good work. If you don't use your tools properly, you cannot do good work. You should at least try, I suppose. But if you want to do good works, you need to use your tools. Although the good works that we're called to do, this won't necessarily believe in the name of the Jesus Christ. <laughs> ah, so <laughs> yeah, that's not going to work real well either. Uh, so uh, hammer, ooh. Uh, Maybe I, oh, I know a hammer won't work, but I can use mm -hmm, power tools. Yeah, yeah, air compressors. Isn't that right, Madam Blueberry? All right, yet, uh, yeah, you'll get that one in a minute. Uh, my power tools uh, are at home, but the power tool that I'm referring to is Jesus Christ. He is the power behind our words. Now, I've heard everybody else ahead of me get up and say something to the effect of, you need to read, right? You need to read the Bible. So, I have my power tool prearranged right here. So we have different tools than a wrench and a hammer and a saw, uh, power saws and air compressors. We have the Word of God. And just as these are tools and equipment, they're also mm -hmm, weapons. They're weapons, yes. Did I hear a little old lady say amen? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'll uh, just, uh... <laughs> no, I must not have. That's it. <sighs> Far be it for me to be deaf. <laughs> All right. So, Second uh, Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. Let me read that for you. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and lofty opinion raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Okay. Those are our weapons, our tools. A little bit back in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 
starting with verse 6, it says, By purity and knowledge, patience and kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown, unknown yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live. And it goes on to go back and forth to say how we wage war. Though the world may call us one thing, we know we are the other. Now, we each have our own tools in life. Some use wrenches, some do not. And as, as men and women... As fathers and mothers, God has given you special tools unique to yourself, to your situation, to the people you'll meet, and the people God will bring to you. He's designed you to speak for him through his word, through reading his word, and through knowing his word. We need to be wise and discerning. Yet that's not exactly enough because we must be, now if you're going to write down, you can write this down, we must be willing to serve. We must be willing to be equipped to use it for good works. We must be willing. Second, we must be practiced. We must practice the tools of our trade. If we don't, we won't be any good at it. And the only way you get good at it is to at least try. Okay? If you goof up hammering a, a nail, you pull the bent nail out and you try again. Because you know people can do it. And you know you can do it. And Romans 6.13 says, Do not present the members, your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. But present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. So we serve God in righteousness. We are practiced and we read the scriptures. We might even study and, oh, we might even memorize them. So that when the pastor or someone else is speaking to us and he, and he brings forth some words from scripture, you're like, oh, yeah. I've heard that before. That's a good one. The last thing you must have is you must have courage for action. You must be willing to step out to prove your faith through action. You look at the prophets in the Old Testament. They weren't anything until they opened their mouth and started speaking. They weren't anything until they act, and then God used them. We must step out on faith and act, and come what may, we belong to God, or we belong to God. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due time we will reap a harvest if we do not to give up. So I saw some people climbing this past week, and they did not give up, and they made it. Easy practice for what is to come. What is good work? Anything that brings God glory, that gives God the credit, anything that seeks someone's highest good and brings them closer to God, being a vessel of honor for God and his good work. So now, as Hebrews says, let us follow Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of God the Father. Amen and amen. Dear Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the men who have shared up here. I thank you for the strength and the joy and the lives you've given us in our fathers. Thank you for your care.